From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Today, ready to fight. That's what China's military says after it conducts three days of military drills around Taiwan following President Tsai Ing-wen's visit with Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Despite the saber rattling, a top U.S. Treasury official says the U.S. is not looking for an economic divorce. The U.S. is not seeking to decouple from China. We're not seeking to limit China's growth. You know, those aren't our strategic objectives. We occasionally or, or frequently have issues with different economic policies in China, and we will always defend U.S. economic interests as well. Uh, but we're not in any way trying to separate these two economies entirely. That, that's just neither practical nor in our interest. We'll discuss the response, the effects, and repercussions with our Bloomberg reporter panel. Plus, tensions in Tennessee. One of two lawmakers kicked out of the state house for protesting gun violence last week could be back in as soon as today, as another mass shooting kills four and injures nine in Louisville. We'll talk gun legislation nationally with Democratic Congressman Maxwell Frost of Florida. And the battle over abortion, the Department of Justice weighing in now on the fight over the pill, Mifepristone filing an appeal and calling the Texas judges ruling over the weekend, banning that pill, extraordinary and unprecedented. The Biden administration preparing now for the long haul. We stand by the FDA's approval uh, of Mifeprestone, and we are prepared for a long legal fight. We'll take a look at the responses with our political panel. Kaylee, it's great to see you here. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. There's been no let up in the news, certainly, from Friday night with those rulings that we're going to talk about on the abortion pill to a pretty hairy weekend when it comes to geopolitics. A much stronger response from China than we expected. In, indeed, and a much stronger response, perhaps delayed after the meeting between House Speaker Kevin McCarthy yeah. and the Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen last week. We thought that China's response was actually muted, and then it mm -hmm. really ramped up over the weekend, and it Taiwan sure saying that this is basically on par with what happened in the aftermath of then-Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last year. It certainly looked a lot like it. And, of course, uh, the leaks. We're going to talk about that first. The Department of Defense probing leaks that detail the U.S. spying on other countries, including an assessment of weaknesses in Ukraine's military. That's where we begin with Bloomberg's Enda Curran and Wendy Benjaminson with us here at the table today. Enda, it's great to see you. Welcome to Washington. The response today from the White House, we should probably hear this first, and I'll get your responses we don't seem to know a lot about what happened. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby today in the White House briefing room. Listen. At this point, do you believe the leak is contained? Are there more documents out there that have not been released publicly? Is this an ongoing threat? We don't know. We truly don't. Okay, so we're talking about potentially hundreds of documents that appeared on social media. We're not sure exactly where they came from. And there's no sense if we're ever going to find out, is there? Well, it's certainly not a good look for the U.S. when you consider they are leading the alliance against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And, of course, the signal now to the global audience is that uh, U.S. intelligence isn't secure in its own right here. And, of course, the, the subplot amongst that is also there's been apparently some U.S. snooping of allies, for example, in South, South Korea is in the mix there. So I would say that at a time when the U.S. is trying to build alliances around the world, both on Ukraine and, of course, to keep keep allies on side over China, I think it's pretty bad optics that this leak is out there and it, it doesn't say a lot for the security of the U.S.'s own intelligence. Well, and on the subject of optics, Wendy, I mean, this comes just, what, a few months after there was all the concern around the spy balloon that China had floating over the U.S., a lot of question around that intelligence gathering, and yet shedding light now on the intelligence gathering efforts of the U.S. government. I can't imagine that helps the already very tense relationship between Washington and Beijing. It, I'm sure it doesn't, even though we don't know where, how this information got out online. Maybe China, maybe Russia, maybe someone else. We just have no idea. As John Kirby kept saying at the briefing, I mean, I don't know was his basic response to do everything as they continue, they say, to brief the president on what I don't know. But they, um, but yes, it's it's awkward as Biden heads to Ireland. He's going to meet with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who was spied upon by the U.S. or the U.K. was. That's going to be an awkward moment. Wendy points us to the idea of misinformation here and that this, this could have come from 
uh, Russia or China. It could have been doctored and then re-released. These are becoming pretty complicated times when it comes to classified documents and, and following the trail. Or it could have been an accident. Maybe someone inadvertently re released it somehow and okay. then it was picked up. You know, as, as Wendy just said, we don't know. But the, I think the end point is that the optics of it are not good, I think, for the U.S., given how sensitive all of this is at the moment. So sensitive over Ukraine, trying to keep everyone on board for that. So sensitive on China and Taiwan. And yet here we are having these leaks whereby you would have allies saying, what if we uh, share our assessment or intelligence with you? What are the chances of it being leaked? So uh, it's not a great look. And just quickly on the subject of Taiwan, because as Joe and I were just discussing, things seem to have escalated over the weekend in terms of the Chinese posturing uh, off that shore. What should we glean from the fact that we did get a delayed, rather dramatic response from the Chinese government, as they had said they were prepared to respond uh, in that fashion, didn't immediately and then ultimately, that is indeed what we saw transpired. What signal is that sending? Well, there was a false dawn. President Macron was in France. China didn't immediately respond. Everyone thought maybe they're just going to let this one slide, but they didn't let it slide. And that was a pretty serious response over the weekend, encircling Taiwan the way that they did. Uh, I would say it's strange how... how all of this language is being normalised. I mean, I've just come from that part of the world and the entire daily conversation is all about Taiwan, East China Sea and the risk of conflict. It's all been normalised to the fact now that people are used to the fact that China is responding in this way against Taiwan. And once upon a time, that would have been a major shock. So, when we get back to this idea of the boy who cried wolf. Every time uh, there's a congressional visit to Taiwan, every Codell gets the treatment of a blockade around <laughs> Taiwan. How long can that go on for? Well, as far as those congressional delegations or Codells are concerned, yeah. it could go on right through the 2024 election, as far as they're concerned. There's nothing better for them than to go to China and provoke a, a, a response for a that member doesn't... Of Congress. Exactly. Yeah. For a, a response that doesn't end up in World War well, III. Well, Michael McCall was there uh, with, with his own, we should note, his own delegation over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin McCarthy did not go all the way to Taiwan. Did that visit kind of prompt this delayed reaction then? I, Maybe. I think that's certainly in the realm of possibility. I mean, it was one thing for Kevin McCarthy to meet with President Tsai while she was here. Yep. And she was here in this hemisphere for other reasons. So that gives the Chinese cover. Michael McCall who was, uh, and the other members of Congress who went, they went. It was in your face. It was, we're in Taiwan. Oh, yeah. We're here. Um, so, yes, I think that might have been a, a just one step further that allowed China to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is the difficulty of the Biden administration's message when they're saying, oh, she's just passing through. This is <laughs> right. routine transit. transit. There's absolutely. a question of, of how that message lands. Very difficult for the administration. There's also, of course, other difficult issues facing the Biden administration right now on the legal front after really dueling, competing rulings over the weekend in regard to access to abortion pills. Now, we know that the Department of Justice has filed an appeal against that Texas ruling, which in theory would make them no longer accessible. But there have been calls, Wendy, to just ignore it yeah. from right. certain members of Congress. Clearly, the administration doesn't want to pursue that route. Right, right. Liberal Democrats or progressives who are frustrated that there is a Republican majority in the House and a very narrow majority in the Senate, and they don't see the things that they want solved solved in their way legislatively. So they're always looking to the White House to do executive orders. The problem with executive orders, as we saw in the transition from the Obama to the Trump administration, is that they can be undone with the stroke of a pen. And Biden is a bit more traditional, former chairman of Senate Judiciary. And he, his spokeswoman, Corinne Jean-Pierre, said today that they will not be ignoring a federal judge's ruling. They're going to let it wend its way through the courts. Now, what's going to happen there is they are, um, the Justice Department has appealed to the Fifth Circuit, which is a, a uh, conservative court. If they rule in the Texas judge's favor because of the Washington state ruling, which is opposite that, that will probably end up at the Supreme Court. Mm. It sounds like, uh, as we look ahead to a campaign season, though, after what we saw in the wake of Dobbs, whether it was Kansas, whether it was this more recent election for the Supreme Court in Wisconsin, this ends up being advantage Democrats. Do you see it that way? Yes, absolutely. Republicans um, are atypically, I would say, really not reading the room on this. Mm -hmm. the, a really solid majority of Americans in the high 60 percent up to 70 percent are in favor of abortion rights. And the, every candidate who focuses on um, anti-abortion rights is losing their elections. Uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida, however, is about to pass a six-week abortion ban uh, in his state. So, you know, and this ruling by the Texas judge 
goes in that same direction. I think it's going to create a real problem for Republicans. All right, Wendy, we have to leave it there. Thank you both so much for joining us. That was Wendy Benjaminson here at Bloomberg and Enda Curran, now in Washington for us as well. Great to see you here. Thank you so much. But coming up, we're going to turn our eyes south. Max Maxwell Frost, the first member of Gen Z in Congress and an advocate for tougher gun laws, joins us in the wake of another tragic mass shooting in the U.S., this one in Louisville, Kentucky. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. Just two weeks after children were shot and killed at a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee, another mass shooting today in Louisville, Kentucky. A gunman opening fire in a bank, killing four. We're joined now by Congressman Maxwell Frost. He is the youngest member of the U.S. House of Representatives and ran for office in the wake of the Parkland shooting in Florida. Congressman, thank you so much for being here on a day in which we have lived many of like many like them before. There has been, I'm sure you're familiar with these statistics, more than 15, at least 15 mass shootings in the U.S. in the state of April or the month of April, 146 year to date. How optimistic are you? What is your degree of confidence that one more makes any difference to this Congress in particular? Not incredibly high for a lot of the members of this Congress. And thank you so much for having me on. You know, I, I've been in this movement for a decade. I got involved in the fight to end gun violence when I was 15 years old for one simple reason. I didn't want to get shot in school. And I've always asked myself the same question. I'm sure a lot of people watching can empathize with this. After every shooting, I always ask myself, is this the one? Is this the one that'll finally push these politicians that are bought and paid for by the NRA and gun lobby to actually do something. And what I've learned over the last several years is there are just many politicians that we have to just vote out and that we have to put people in who actually give a damn about the lives of our children and the lives of our people more than they do corporate profit. The majority of this country is for things like universal background checks. The majority of Republicans and NRA members are for universal background checks. So it brings the question, why is it law? Well, because bipartisanship for the rest of us means what we can agree on. And bipartisanship on this issue in Congress means what the NRA is okay with. And we can't stand and we can't accept politicians who will uh, side with the NRA instead of the American people. We lose 100 lives a day due to gun violence. Each one of those deaths is a policy failure. Congressman, I want to bring our viewers inside a hearing that you were a part of just a couple of weeks ago before we ever got onto this conversation and these most recent shootings. This was a Judiciary Committee hearing, and it was involving the ATF and the role that, that it is playing. Uh, I believe the committee called it the ATF's assault on the Second Amendment, just, just to be clear. It was at that hearing that the parents of Joaquin Oliver were thrown out uh, for protesting, and you had some passionate words before you left that hearing yourself. Let's listen. Today's hearing is about distracting the people from the truth. I, for one, believe this has nothing to do with policy and everything to do with politics, and I won't be listening to another second of it, and I wouldn't blame you all if you made the same decision. I yield back. Chair recognizes Representative Higgins. Congressman, tell us what you heard from your colleagues, specifically your Republican colleagues on the panel that day. Our Republican colleagues decided to take that entire hearing and use it to spread lies and spew lies, not just about the ATF, but about uh, good measures to end gun violence. And they do this because it is a wedge issue for them. It is something that they use to activate a voter base. They don't give a damn about everyday gun owners. You know, the NRA is not an advocacy organization. It is a lobbying front for gun manufacturers. And it's but all about the But did they engage you, sense. Congressman? I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, this is where most people leave off. Was there a conversation off camera that day between you and the other members of that committee for better or worse? Or did everyone go home? 
No, there wasn't a conversation. And we w- I want these hearings to be a place where the- it's a place of conversation, a place of learning. But what you'll see, and that was Oversight and Judiciary Committee, but w- and I sit on the Oversight Committee, is what you'll see is they're not interested in the conversations. They're not interested in facts. They're using these committees as a TV tool to build up their messaging for 2024. The next two years are one big campaign for the Republican majority in Congress, especially on that committee. They weren't interested in having the conversation. Look back, roll the tape on that entire hearing. It's just them grilling one of the witnesses. Uh, Some of them didn't even ask any questions of the witnesses, just use their time to spew lies. And they're not interested in the conversation. That's part of the reason why when Patricia Oliver stood up and said one thing, you took my son and sat down, the chair of that committee disgraced the room by saying, get that woman out of here or something along those lines. That's not how we work in this country. You give a warning or something, Not, not to the family of Joaquin Oliver who was shot by an AR-15 in his classroom and died in a pool of his own blood because of the inaction of the same politicians in that room. Look, I'm okay with having discussion, but a lot of these folks, uh, especially the Republicans on this committee, understand how disingenuous this conversation is from their point. They're not interested in talking about it. They want to label us as gun-grabbing liberals and move on to get votes, when that's not what we're talking about. The legislation we're putting forward is actually champion by the majority of people in their own party. So why aren't they for it? And it all goes back to politics versus policy. Well, if we could focus on another area of policy and the politics around it, Congressman, over the course of the last, uh, well, really, you could argue months, but last several days has been access to the abortion pill with competing rulings here in the U.S. And this comes as your Florida within the next week, maybe two, could see a signature on a bill that would ban abortions after six weeks. As a representative from Florida, as well as a representative of the youth being the youngest sitting member in the U.S. House right now, how divisive is this issue in particular and how do you see it affecting your party as well as the one across the aisle? The interesting thing is a lot of people would say this issue is incredibly divisive, and there are people on many different sides. But what you see poll after poll is the majority of Americans are for the right to have a safe and legal access to abortion, plain and simple. But just like gun violence, just like guns, we see that the politics of the Republican Party leadership use this use this issue to rev up their base before and during elections, and that tends to be the extent of the advocacy. You know, if you want to talk about being uh, – pro-life and being pro-children, why are they simultaneously passing bills that ban books in schools? Why are they simultaneously passing bills at the in Florida legislature, permitless carry, where you don't have to have a permit to conceal carry a weapon, and they want to call a special uh, session to do the same thing with open carry? Uh, it just it just shows the hypocrisy going on. And it's not all Republicans. You know, there's people watching at home now who are saying, well, I'm a Republican. I don't believe in that. And look, this has to do with the Republican leadership that wants to use and pass these far, far, far right bills, radical far right bills to help get them elected to office. But what they don't understand is a majority of people are not for bills like this that completely, pretty much completely ban abortion. After six weeks, most people don't even know if they're pregnant at that point. And so it's it's completely ridiculous. It's un-American and it's infringing on our freedoms and our liberties uh, 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 that are prescribed to us in the Constitution. Well, Congressman, when we back off these issues, and I could probably add a few more, it really speaks to your effort, and I'd like to hear from you on it, to try to, to, to make Congress younger and more diverse. And you're trying to get to that by changing FEC rules that would help uh, members of Congress uh, get paid from campaign uh, finance coffers, if I'm putting that correctly. So it's not just a large, a large number of wealthy people who can forego a paycheck for a while. Am I right? Exactly. And, you know, when most people hear Maxwell Frost is trying to make it so candidates can pay them for themselves, a lot of people might say, whoa, you know, I don't want that. But you, you said it exactly. And I, I draw from personal experience. When you run for Congress, it is a full time job. And it is difficult mm-hmm. to hold a job while you run. And for a lot of people, it's impossible. I drove Uber during it. 
But because of that, I didn't have enough money to live. And this is part of the reason why the people who run for office a lot of the time are already independently wealthy because they can afford to not have an incoming paycheck for a long time and they can focus on running for office. And it creates a yeah. problem where all we are electing to office are people who are very wealthy. I, for one, believe we need more working class people represented in office. Yes, younger people, but also just working class people in general. And so what mm -hmm. we're, we're focusing focusing on what we're pushing the FEC to do is allow the expansion of candidate salaries so that way candidates can pay their rent, can pay for food, can have an income while they're running for office. Uh, running for office shouldn't automatically be a prescription to living in poverty or financial ruin. And unfortunately for me, I went into financial ruin during my campaign, ran up insane credit card debt. Now I got elected, I won, I have a light at the end of the tunnel, but a lot of people who don't win uh, are, are left. Yeah are left with the bill. And it's it's unfortunate and it's un-American. My North Star is we need publicly funded elections. But until we get there, this is a good step in the right direction. Someday I'd love to know how many of those Uber riders voted for Maxwell Frost. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Joining us today from Florida, Maxwell Frost on Balance of Power. Coming up, the IMF and World Bank hold their spring meetings in Washington this week. It's about to get started. We'll take a look on what to expect next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Global financial leaders meeting this week in Washington with questions about the trajectory of our economy and the status of our relationship with the world's second largest economy. Here to discuss is our chief economist, Tom Orlick. Tom, it's great to see you. Uh, the China question is going to be hanging over these IMF meetings starting right now, aren't they? So one big positive which China is bringing to the global economy this year, Joe, is growth. Mm -hmm. um, U.S., we think, has a recession in the second half. Europe was lucky to dodge a recession at the start of the year. China, because of COVID reopening, we think is going to have 5.8% growth this year, a big boost for the rest of the global economy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are some vexed and challenging questions for the rest of the world as they grapple with China's sudden rise. Um, high on the list at the IMF meetings, um, how China engages in debt settlements. Mm. Countries from Sri Lanka um, to Pakistan um, to a number of African countries, Zambia among them, wrestling with huge debt, much of it owed to China and a very difficult conversation taking place here in D.C. and between D.C. and Beijing on how China and other people who are holding that debt should help these countries move towards a resolution. Really interesting, Tom. Sorry it was so short, but thank you so much, Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics. Really interesting uh, warning from the IMF out today as well about how a decoupled U.S. and China could ultimately hit 2% of global GDP. Well, on the subject of economic growth and what it means for energy demand, former U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz will be here with us to discuss that, nuclear power as well, and more. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The U.S. Department of Defense says it is working around the clock to figure out the scope and scale of classified information that was leaked and distributed on social media. The documents containing information on Ukraine's military, U.S. spying tactics, as well as information about North Korea's missile program and Iran's nuclear program. Joining us now to discuss is the CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative and former U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, who helped negotiate the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being here and welcome to you. As we talk about the information being leaked. Can you just shed some light on what knowledge we do have about the advancement of the nuclear programs in countries like Iran? Well, first of all, Kelly, we're, we're facing many, many nuclear weapons challenges right now. Uh, in Iran, uh, the unfortunate decision in 2018 to withdraw from that now has them uh, with, uh, let's say, roughly 100 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. They could move very quickly to a bomb if they chose. Uh, North Korea obviously has nuclear weapons, uh, in contrast to Iran, but there 
uh, their progress in delivery systems, including apparently missiles that could reach the United States, is, of course, extremely uh, threatening. Uh, in, in addition, the Northeast Asia uh, nuclear situation is going to get more complicated as China uh, greatly expands its nuclear weapons uh, arsenal. And then if I go uh, a bit west uh, to, uh, to Ukraine uh, and the situation with the Russian invasion, of course, we have Putin talking about uh, tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Uh, we have him uh, rattling the nuclear saber, uh, upending the nuclear order. We have the end, apparently, the end of arms control uh, facing us uh, uh, squarely uh, ahead. So we have a lot of work to do to uh, re-examine our basic assumptions, our basic approach uh, to nuclear deterrence, because certainly no one really wants uh, to see a nuclear weapon used uh, but in the current dangerous situation, blunder and miscalculation uh, could easily lead to a uh, to a failed uh, a failed situation for all of us. That's a scary thought. I think you're referring to Vladimir Putin's decision to suspend participation uh, in the new START treaty, Mr. Secretary, with with regard Correct. to arms control. Some have suggested that Russia wasn't playing along to begin with anyway. How much of an added risk is that for the U.S.? Oh, I, I think it's considerable because, of course, we've had many many decades of strategic stability based upon arms control. There have always been issues, uh, but frankly, it's only through arms control that we've also had inspections, we've had transparency. Uh, we, can, we can check on things, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now uh, the last remaining agreement is what you referred to, Joe, New START. Uh, that expires in uh, early 2026. Uh, and right now there's nothing being done clearly uh, to extend beyond there. So uh, we think probably there's a lot of work to do still uh, in terms of non-treaty approaches uh, to strategic stability, uh, hopefully with the ability to eventually return to that uh, process uh, and, frankly, to return to it not just with uh, Russia, but we're going to have to consider uh, China's uh, growth, uh, pro probably the P5, uh, that is Russia, China, United States, UK, and France, uh, the five mm -hmm. recognized nuclear weapons powers in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, are going to have to find a way uh, to get probably engaged in some kind of multilateral discussions, uh, because strategic stability is in all of our interests. How hopeful are you, though, that those discussions can yield any outcome? As we know, there has been ongoing conversation around whether there could be some form of return to a deal with uh, Iran, for example. It seems that that is very hard to find progress in. What is your degree of confidence that some progress on agreement on nuclear weapons can be made? And what role does the U.S. have to play in that? Well, first of all, I think in Iran, uh, as you've said, I very much doubt that the JCPOA, the Iran agreement, will come back uh, in its previous form. Uh, we're going to have to look at, uh, at other ways of uh, addressing Iran's regional um, um, mischief, uh, uh, as well as their, their nuclear program. I would say there, what I find uh, potentially uh, a foundation for doing more is, for example, the uh, progress made in restoring Iran-Saudi uh, relationships. Uh, maybe there's a Gulf area uh, nuclear program that we could pursue there. With regard to, uh, to Russia and China, uh, it's going to be a while, uh, clearly. Uh, there are some steps. For example, uh, former Senator Sam Nunn and I uh, recently, uh, uh, last week, published in Foreign Affairs uh, a step that we believe could be practical in terms of addressing uh, the issue of blunder. Uh, it's in all of our interests uh, to internationalize uh, that with China, UK, France, et cetera. Uh, so there are some steps that we can take. But in terms of a full-fledged arms control, uh, it's going to be years, I think, until trust, uh, sufficient trust can be rebuilt uh, to get serious negotiations going with Russia. And China has always been uh, very reluctant to get into uh, nuclear arms uh, discussions, uh, mainly because they've had such a small arsenal compared to ours and compared to Russia's. Of course, if that changes, uh, it's a, uh, I suppose, some kind of silver lining that maybe the opportunity for discussions there will, will open up. Uh, but it's a very, very well, dangerous you, situation. We'd love to ask you while you're with us about refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, knowing that there was 
at least a brief opportunity to do so at profit a couple of weeks ago. Citigroup's Ed Morse tells us prices should drop below OPEC's preferred price. Listen. Yeah, we think prices could go down uh, much below the preferred OPEC plus price of 80 to 70 and even touch below that. Uh, we think there'll be market mechanisms that work to kind of work in the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, that includes the U.S. buying of strategic uh, uh, petroleum reserve oil, it includes China accelerating its, its inventory. Of course, a barrel of oil was selling for something in the 60s just a couple of weeks ago. Did we miss an opportunity? Well, we had said, uh, the Biden administration had said that we would start uh, refilling uh, the petroleum reserve uh, when prices went below mm -hmm. 70. They were pretty briefly below 70, I have to say. Uh, but I'll, I'll say, Joe, I think a bigger problem, and this was the case when I was secretary, uh, the, the Congress um, uh, did not, uh, I think, uh, put enough emphasis on energy security issues at that time. Now, of course, there's a very, very different view. But the reality is, uh, when I was secretary, and I complained about this to uh, committee chairs and the like, uh, that they started to use the, the petroleum reserve, frankly, as a piggy bank uh, to address other issues, important issues, but not connected to energy and security. For example, uh, addressing uh, health, health research, cancer research, uh, was partly funded for by uh, by writing a uh, an IOU against the against the petroleum reserve. Now we wish we had those hundreds of millions of barrels uh, back in the reserve. Uh, so um, I think Ed Morse is right that uh, prices could drop lower, but we don't know. It's uh, it's really going to de de depend, I think, very much on the great uncertainty in uh, in in demand. Uh, we just heard on your program uh, that uh, China may uh, start growing again. Uh, increasing demand, but the West may go into recession, which would obviously suppress demand. I think we just don't know. Uh, but as if prices do drop, I would certainly uh, uh, support uh, getting getting the SPRO back to a useful tool. Right now, it's been depleted, and there are further liens on it, as I said, from Congress, uh, that if we had another major uh, issue to deal with, uh, we would be severely compromised with the current size of the petroleum reserve. Mm -hmm. Ernest Moniz, CEO of Nuclear Threat Initiative and former U.S. Energy Secretary, we thank you for the insights. It sounds like they should have been doing some buying. Yeah, perhaps, or perhaps they should have just been using the strategic petroleum reserve differently all along than just to manage prices at the yeah. pump. Well, and we're, of course, walking up on the summer driving season. So yeah. the, the potential for being tapped before it being refilled again? is probably great. Especially as you have a 2024 election still looming on the horizon, and we know that gas prices are front and center to the American people that still are grappling with inflationary pressures that have been very difficult politically yeah, for the Biden administration. Sure. Coming up, we'll have a lot more on this. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Now keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Highland. In Louisville, Kentucky today, police say a 23-year-old used a rifle to kill four people at the bank where he worked. At least eight other people, including two police officers, were wounded. Police exchanged gunfire with the shooter who died. The state's governor, Andrew Scheer, said one of the victims was a close friend of his. Donald Trump's new accounting firm has agreed to hand over documents subpoenaed by the New York State Attorney General in the state's $250 million civil lawsuit. Whitley Penn says it will provide all information related to the start of the business relationship with the Trump Organization and all records related to Trump's statement of financial condition. Trump and three of his children are accused of inflating the value of assets of the family's real estate business. Iran accused the U.S. of warmongering after the American military said in a rare disclosure that it's deployed a nuclear-powered submarine in the Middle East. The vessel will support the Bahrainian-based Fifth Fleet. Tensions between Washington and Tehran have flared lately, with Iranian proxies launching more attacks on American troops and their allies in Syria and Iraq. And former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi is showing signs of improvement. That's according to his doctors at a Milan hospital who say he's still receiving intensive care treatment. The 86-year-old was hospitalized last week to treat a pulmonary infection linked to chronic leukemia. Berlusconi is Italy's, Italy's longest-serving former premier. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Highland, and this is Bloomberg.
Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Reproductive rights back in the spotlight today as President Biden vows to fight a ruling over the abortion drug uh, Milfopristone. Joining us now, our political panel, Rick Davis, Stone Court Capital, Jeannie Shanzano of Iona University, political science professor. Jeannie, I'll start with you on this one. Milfopristone has become uh, a household name all of a sudden, along with this judge who ruled on Friday night. But we have dueling rulings creating a lot of confusion here. The judge in Texas says that this uh, should go away and, and the FDA uh, approval for it. There's another judge, though, on the West Coast who says it should stay. Is this all headed to the Supreme Court? You know, I think it is, and I think it should head to the Supreme Court because it is, you know, inconceivable to me that even a court as conservative as this one, which did overturn Roe, would look and say that a federal judge can overturn the uh, approval of a drug by the, by the appropriate agency 20 to 30 years after the fact. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, unthinkable to me that they would go in that direction because it opens up a Pandora's box. And let's be very clear who this judge is. He was an anti-abortion lawyer before Donald Trump appointed him to the bench. He's sitting in Amarillo. The plaintiffs did forum shop to get the case there, knowing what they would get. And I urge everybody to read this decision. It sounds less like a legal, legal decision and more like an amicus brief or some kind of activist rant about anti-abortion rhetoric. Things like women who have taken this drug have been, gotten depressed and felt regret and suicidal. There is not one scintilla of scientific evidence to support that. So that's what we're getting. And I do hope the Supreme Court looks at this and says, enough is enough. We can't abide by this, even though six of us are obviously pro-life. Well, and of course, you had members of Congress on both sides of the aisle in the aftermath of this, from AOC to Nancy Mace, saying that this should just be ignored. The Biden administration, though, says they are not going to do that. Take a listen to the White House Press Secretary, Green Jean-Pierre, earlier. There is a process in place for appealing uh, this type of decision, and we will uh, pursue that process vigorously. That's what the American people can count on from the Biden-Harris administration and do everything that we can to prevail in the courts. So, Rick, is this just a question of the precedent that could be set being a bit too dangerous for this administration? Well, I think there are uh, precedents being set all over the country because now we've sort of unraveled uh, this whole issue because of the decision by the Supreme Court last summer on Dobbs and said basically states do your will and this is a, a, a classic example of one more state doing their will. It's not even his most extreme version uh, compared to some other states that are that are taking action but the bottom line is as this, the press secretary said the Justice Department filed a appeal today uh, against the Texas ruling uh, on standing. Uh, this public policy group that went to them they don't take the pill and they're not affected by abortion. So why would they even be uh, have any standing in the lawsuit? So my guess is uh, these are folks who know what they're doing over at the Justice Department. They'll probably get an appeal win, but it's not going to solve the problem, which is uh, these state judges or federal judges, uh, many of which were appointed during the Trump administration. Uh, it was a record number of federal judges got through. Uh, and, and, and the Republican Party and the American people are going to pay a price for these heavily ideological judges uh, weighing in on issues like abortion. Of course, Rick, the Dobbs was followed by Kansas, which was followed by the midterms, and, and the Dobbs ruling clearly had an impact there. Then the Wisconsin Supreme Court election last week, now this. What will be the Republican Party uh, position on abortion in 2024? Yeah, I think uh, all we know is it's getting more extreme, right? We see actions right now in Florida, you know, where the Florida legislature, one year ago, they passed a limit to abortion at 15 weeks, and now they've got a bill one year later to go to six weeks, mm -hmm. and seemingly encouraged by future presidential candidate Ron yeah. DeSantis. Yeah. Uh, the Wisconsin decision, or the Wisconsin election, is something every Republican should dig into. We got creamed in the suburbs with women. Gee, I wonder why. Probably led by the same abortion issues that the Dobbs uh, decision unleashed on the midterms, mm -hmm. where we got beat in many districts that we didn't think we were otherwise going to win. Well, I'm glad, Rick, that you brought up Ron DeSantis and the potential of the signing of that six-week uh, ban on abortions in Florida. Jeannie, how do you think that plays for him 
on the national electorate level, given what we have seen in the other races that Joe was just mentioning as a potential presidential candidate in 2024? How is that going to stack him up to, compared to other potential contenders? You know, in the general election, should he make it so far, it's not going to help him. And we've seen that over and over again. We saw that in 2020. We saw that in the midterm in 2022. They are having trouble, they being the Republicans who take these stands, with women, as Rick just mentioned, with young people, with independents, with moderates in the suburbs. And these elections are tight elections. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. It will be a tight election, whoever is on the ballot. But that's why losing these moderates, losing women in the suburbs is going to matter so much. But I think what Ron DeSantis is doing and what he's setting himself up to do his campaign is they are trying to play to the base right now, hoping to get themselves into and through the primary. And then we may see him pivot a little bit. But pivoting on something like a six-week ban on abortion before many women even know that they are pregnant is going to be very, very tough to do. So I think he's setting himself up for trouble in the general election should he go forward in this regard. And let's not forget about his recent movement on gun control. Same issue there. Well, Jeannie, hold that thought because we are going to come back to that issue. Rick and Jeannie will be staying with us as we dive into the political fighting over gun rights in Tennessee in the aftermath of another mass shooting in Louisville, Kentucky today. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television. Happening moments ago, the Nashville Governing Council voted unanimously to return expelled black lawmaker Justin Jones to the Tennessee House. That's, of course, after he and another fellow lawmaker were ousted after protesting uh, related to gun violence on the House floor last week. Let's welcome back Bloomberg contributors Rick Davis and Jeannie Shane Zeno. So, Rick, is all that the Republicans in the Tennessee House were able to accomplish through this entire ordeal, raising the political profile of those they ousted? Oh, absolutely. I think that this is one of the most unforced errors of the uh, year so far by Republicans. Uh, just because you have a supermajority doesn't mean you use it for just about anything you want. And in this case, they were angry. Republicans on the floor. Uh, rules were broken. Decorum was... was, was uh, uh, you know, thrown uh, on the wayside through this protest that the two Justins uh, helped manage. And, um, and they reacted in, uh, unfortunately, with emotion rather than with their heads. And, and now they've created superstars, right? These guys are going to come back to the legislature. They're going to have, you know, statewide name ID that they never would have had any other way. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if one or either uh, don't run for statewide office in the next election cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll be feted in the White House before the week is out. I mean, you know, the Republicans have really stubbed their toe on this, and they've done it uh, for all the wrong reasons, not on a policy basis, but just because they could get away with it. And this is the problem with supermajorities, right? Mm -hmm. You start thinking like everybody agrees with you, mm -hmm. and then you make these kinds of mistakes. This is going to go down as a real faux pas for Republicans in that state. Jeannie, to Rick's point, you've got two political celebrities now. You might have had a third. With that said, after they visit the White House, after they do late night and morning TV shows and all the rest of the stuff that comes with this, I suspect one of them shows up at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Who knows? Is that not unlike the last conversation we were having about abortion? When you look at this from a national perspective, that becomes advantage Democrats, or is this one different? No, it is advantage Democrats. And, you know, I, I, it's sad to even say that or think that way because politically it is, but we're talking about an issue of violence. You just had an excellent interview with a congressman who came to Congress to pass common sense gun reform. Today, we had a shooting in Louisville, and it's stunning. 100 days into the year, 146 mass shootings. Two people who were victimized today are friends with the governor of that state. It is stunning. So, yes, these 
these three people broke decorum and the two young yeah. black representatives were expelled from Congress. But, you know, breaking decorum, I get it's not a great thing to do, but we have to think about what we're talking about. So this is absolutely overreach to Rick's point and your point on the part of mm -hmm. Republicans, very much like what we're seeing in the case of abortion. And it is helping the Democrats in a case in which politically it helps them. But yeah. it's a sad day for all of us. Though we shouldn't confuse that at the moment there appears to be no path on Capitol Hill on this matter. Judy Shanzano, Rick Davis, thanks as ever. Our panel today, I'm Joe Matthew with Kaylee Lines here in Washington. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter. And thanks for joining us today. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.